It's, a, it's an honor and a, a joy to be here at the seminary again and uh, to spend some time uh, with you talking about the importance of apologetics and discernment and developing a Christian response to the challenges uh, to the faith um, in a very confusing time. So uh, my topic, faithfully founded on fact, that's a, a bit of a, uh, a variation on a very significant apologetics book from the 70s called Faith Founded on Fact by John Warwick Montgomery. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm gonna be talking about uh, basically about apologetics in relationship to what this whole conference has been about. Uh, we'll start with a little, uh, a little game here, I guess you could call it. Uh, which of these news stories do you think is true? Uh, Pope Francis canceled the Bible and proposed a new holy book. Uh, former Republican Congresswoman Michelle Bachman said that, and I quote, Jesus created assault rifles, end quote. You don't like that one either, huh? An animal rights group is suing in Connecticut to have elephants recognized legally as persons. What do you think about that one? You like that one, huh? And finally, former Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin reported seeing a UFO spacecraft during the mission. All right, so how many of you like the Pope one? How many of you like the Buzz Aldrin one? Michelle Bachman and the assault rifles and the elephants as persons. There seems to be general uh, a favor toward the elephants. You guys did much better than the last group I asked. Indeed. Uh, an animal rights group in Connecticut in November of last year uh, filed a legal petition to have three elephants declared to be persons. Uh, you guys did very well, but many people find it difficult to separate out the facts from the fake news. Uh, how about this? Here are some uh, religions. You tell me which of these religions do you think actually exists? The first one is called the All One God Faith, which sells a magic soap, that's their term, uh, with, uh, that's able to help people cleanse themselves for both body and soul in preparation for uniting all humanity. That's the all, God, all one God faith. Second, the North Texas Church of Free Thought is a uh, religious organization for atheists. Uh, the Peyote Way Church of God uses the drug peyote as a uh, Native American sacrament. And then finally, the Temple of the Jedi Order advocates a religious philosophy inspired by the Star Wars films. All right, which one do you guys like, uh, or which ones do you guys like as, as true? Real? I'm hearing all. I, I can't get anything past you guys. All four religions actually exist. A true story, I was at a Bed Bath & Beyond a couple months ago looking for something and found the soap. I didn't know at the time what it was all about, but now I do, it's kind of interesting. Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a Jedi wedding there you see with the lightsabers. Uh, so yeah, all four of these religions actually exist. Uh, I was tempted to throw in the uh, 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 first church of Presbyterianism which is uh, devoted to the memory of Elvis Presley, but to be honest, it's a spoof, so it's not a real religion. <clears throat> In a society of so many different religions, it's easy to feel confused. However, the only good motivation for believing something and believing anything is that you are convinced it is true. C.S. Lewis said, Christianity is not a patent medicine. Christianity claims to give an account of facts to tell you what the real universe is like. If Christianity is untrue, then no honest man will want to believe it, however helpful it might be. If it is true, 
every honest man will want to believe it, even if it gives him no help at all. Now, this is very contrary to the spirit of the age in which we want to believe something because of what we think we're going to get out of it. And Lewis says, if that's your motivation, you've got the whole thing wrong. Time magazine, uh, after, last year after Donald Trump want, was elected president of the United States, uh, asked if truth was dead. It's a good question, even if the timing seems to be politically motivated and somewhat suspicious. Um, one imagines that would not have been uh, on the cover of Time magazine if somebody else had won. But in any case, that's just a, it's still a good question, and no matter where you are politically, it's a question that needs to be asked. Pilate's question to Jesus, what is truth, has become more critical and arguably confusing to many people than ever. Now, there's two extremes I want to suggest that we need to avoid. One of these is the extreme of relativism and the other dogmatism. Relativist claims and dogmatic claims can be easily contrasted so that you get the idea. Not everybody that's in one camp or the other is going to say all these things, but they are typical of the two ways of thinking. For relativists, very often, they will say that truth is different for everyone. Whereas the dogmatist says that truth is our exclusive property. Truth copyrighted, our group. Relativists believe that there are no essential truths that everybody needs to know. Dogmatists claim everything that we affirm is <laughs> essential simply because we affirm it. Relativists, no one can really say who's a Christian or not, shouldn't be making those kinds of judgments. The dogmatist Christian says, we alone are Christians. And you can see Christians has been trademarked now by this group. <clears throat> Relativists do not think that scripture is inerrant. And if it were, there'd be no way of knowing it, I guess. Uh, dogmatists very often claim that they have uh, an infallible or inerrant knowledge of scripture. So not only is scripture inerrant, but their knowledge, their understanding of scripture is without error. For the relativist, love is much more important than truth. Love should be given priority over truth. Let's just be nice to each other. For the dogmatist, though they may not admit it, truth takes precedence over love. There's no point in trying to love somebody if they're not going to believe what I believe. Well, what's wrong with relativism? Well, it's, a, it's really a kind of agnosticism in disguise. The relativist is unwilling to commit to a particular belief. There's nothing wrong with admitting you don't know something. Agnosticism in that sense is fine, but agnosticism as a settled position is an abdication of responsibility to learn the truth and live by it. I love Calvin and Hobbes. You can see them there. Uh, <clears throat> Hobbes asks Calvin, uh, what are you doing uh, for your New Year's re resolution? And uh, Calvin says, uh, I didn't make any. See, in order to impo improve oneself, one must have some idea of what's good. That implies certain values. It is, as we know, values, are, and as we know, values are relative. Every system of belief is equally valid. So we just need to tolerate diversity. Virtue isn't better than vice, it's just different. And Hobbes says, I don't know if I can tolerate that much tolerance. <laughs> Calvin, I refuse to be victimized by notions of virtuous behavior. Well, this kind of thinking is not very practical, and it's also self-defeating, because any time you affirm the truth of relativism, you are acting as though, you are speaking as though relativism isn't true, at least with regard to relativism. That can get into all kinds of fun of chasing one's tail. In fact, most if not all of the religions that uh, teach some form of relativism claim to be the truth. Hindus certainly think they believe in the truth. 
uh, Buddhists, Taoists even, even though all of these religions in one form or another claim that truth is unknowable, they still write books. Okay, and the books affirm something, they claim something that they want you to accept. Well, what about dogmatism? Well, dogmatism is really kind of akin to uh, Gnosticism. Gnosticism has many definitions, but one would be salvation by knowledge, which only this particular group can give you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, dogmatism is also impractical. Uh, it, doesn't, it's not, it doesn't really work, and it's self-deceiving. People think they know it all. We had a sign in our house when I was growing up that said, those of you who think you know it all are really annoying to those of us who do. Um, <clears throat> you can see here that uh, this is uh, another comic strip. Lu uh, uh, Charlie Brown is talking to his dog Snoopy, and he says, I hear you're writing a book about theology. I hope you have a good title. And Snoopy says, I have the perfect title. Has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? <laughs> For some of us, the answer is no, it never occurred to me. Um, uh, really, dogmatism is another form of abdication of responsibility. It's refusing to take responsibility to admit that you don't know everything and somebody else might know something you don't. It's refusing to learn, to deal with the reality that we are never going to be infallible, we're never going to know all the answers, we're never going to have it 100% right. We'd like to think we are potentially able to have it all together that way, but in fact, we can't and we don't. So let's talk about an evangelical Christian view of truth. And this is all going to be taken from the Apostle Paul. Paul is the first uh, cross-cultural Christian missionary, unless you count Stephen, I guess you could count him, or Philip, or rather, not Stephen, Philip. Uh, but he's, he, he really pioneers cross-cultural missions. He's also the church's first theologian and first philosopher. And uh, so we will look to Paul for some philosophy here. Uh, according to the Apostle Paul, the truth is the same for everyone, but our knowledge of the truth is always partial, it's always fallible, it's always incomplete, and therefore you know something I don't know and vice versa. That doesn't mean the truth is different for different people, but it means that our perception and understanding of the truth is person variable. Now, would I wish that that wasn't the case? Yeah, but unfortunately it is. Not everybody knows the same things or knows it from the same perspective. Knowledge of the truth can lead to salvation, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.15, but we're not saved just by knowing stuff. You're not saved because you know theology. So if you came to seminary to study theology so that you could be saved, you had it backwards. <laughs> Christians who have come into a relationship with God obviously want to study theology because they want to know everything about the God who loves them and saved them. But theology doesn't save anybody. What theology does is protect and safeguard the gospel of salvation so that people can get the gospel without it being corrupted in transmission. So theology is very, very important. Scripture's teaching is essential to the process of bringing people into a relationship with God. But we're not saved by passing a doctrinal exam. We're not saved by being theologically correct. Scripture as the word of God is inerrant, but our knowledge of scripture is not inerrant. And unless you can recite the entire Bible in the original languages from start to finish, from memory, and you have settled in your mind with 100% certainty all the textual vari variables, all the textual variants, you do not have an inerrant knowledge of Scripture. And neither do I. It's just the way it is. Some of us know Scripture better than others, I'm not denying that, but none of us has an infallible or unimpeachable knowledge of the entirety of the teachings of Scripture. 
Now, some truths are essential to Christianity. You can tell because at times Jesus or one of the apostles like Paul will say, you got to know this. you got to believe this. This is important. This is essential. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain, 1 Corinthians 15. I can't believe you're falling for another gospel, Galatians 1, 6 to 9. Paul is very concerned about certain issues where he draws a line and says, this is non-negotiable. This must be upheld as the truth. But not everything is treated that way, and it's not essential to know or understand everything. Paul didn't even understand some of his own visionary experiences. So he tells us about one in 2 Corinthians 12 where he says, I don't even know if I was in my body or not when it happened. Well, shouldn't you know? (laughs) Even he didn't know, and it was him having the experience. So we're always going to have unanswered questions. We can know what sound Christian belief is. We can practice true Christian living and know that w- what we're supposed to be doing, but uh, we can't know definitively who is saved and who is not. We can't know all the answers, and we can't know people's hearts. We can warn people, if you're following this way, it's not the way of salvation. It's not the true gospel. It's, it's, a, it's heresy. It's false doctrine. You're following a false prophet. All of those are legitimate things to say. But that doesn't mean we know what's going on in a person's heart, and of course we don't know their future either. Knowledge without love fosters pride. Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 to 3. He says uh, in that context that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We are to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. Now there's the balance between the relativist who wants to put love over truth and the dogmatist who ends up putting truth over love they go hand in hand they belong together Um, there are a lot of misunderstandings or misperceptions about faith and reason I wish these were all outside the church but they're not (laughs) some of these you will find people inside the church who are at least confused on some of these issues so for example the idea Uh, that faith means believing what you know isn't so. Or something that is obviously unbelievable and stupid. So one thinks of little Natalie Wood playing the little girl in Miracle on 34th Street in the car repeating to herself, it's stupid, but I believe. (laughs) That's the way many people think about faith. Faith, and there are a number of statements in that movie, by the way, that are along those lines, even spoken by adults. That faith means believing something that isn't reasonable, that doesn't make sense. Uh, That, in fact, it's somehow inherent in the definition of faith, that it's contrary to reason or or implausible or or in some other way uh, uh, flies in the face of, of, of intelligent thought. That is simply not the case. Uh, The Bible is a book about reason, about the God of reason who created the world, uh, reflecting his own rational, uh, intelligent mind, exhibiting consistency and patterns and and even laws that reflect his own care and his own uh, mind, and invites us to use our minds to understand the world we live in and to hear, read, and understand his word in Scripture. You cannot read the Bible without using your brain. It's not possible. There are religious groups running around saying that you don't understand Scripture with your mind, you understand it with your spirit. I'm sorry, you don't even understand what you just said because it doesn't make any sense. Understanding is, by definition, a function of the mind. Some of the Word of Faith teachers, by the way, have taught that. It probably is pretty much endemic to the movement. So faith, of course, believes things that we can't prove. There are things that we can't prove that uh, we do believe. But that doesn't mean that faith can't uh, be supportable 
uh, by reason. It doesn't mean that some things can't be proven. Uh, these are category mistakes, if I can use a, a philosophical term here. Uh, faith isn't about whether it's reasonable or not or whether it's provable or not. Faith is a response to God of trust, of reliance, of acceptance, of humbly saying yes to God. It's not about whether, how much of it you can prove or not prove. Some people have strong evidence of supporting a lot of what they believe as Christians. Others have never thought about it. That doesn't mean that Christianity isn't reasonable. It just means some people have not explored that aspect of the faith. Well, I could camp on that all day, but I won't. Let's talk a little bit about how to see through what we could call fake news about Christianity. First of all, whenever you hear something or read something, especially on Facebook, drill down to the original source or sources for the alleged fact. Oh, they found a gospel that had been suppressed by the church that reveals that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. Really? Okay, where can I find out about this? Sometimes you have to go down three, four, five sources to get past notfakenews.com or whatever it is, you know, until you finally get to something substantial. And then you find out, okay, this is a, a gospel that was probably written in the third century in one language, and we've got one tattered fifth century copy of part of it, and there are holes in the sentence that talk about Jesus and Mary, and we're not sure exactly what it's about. That's it. That's very common. That kind of, uh, when you drill down to the alleged documentary evidence, it turns out to crumble in your fingers. Obviously, a text from the third or fourth century uh, that if it did, which it doesn't clearly, but if it did claim that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were husband and wife, there would be no reason to think that that was a more reliable account about Jesus than what we have in the New Testament. They say, well, the New Testament doesn't say Jesus wasn't married. Everything about the way the story is told shows that he wasn't. Okay, and that, uh, there's more that could be said, but I, I'm not going to take too much on that. Related to that issue about whether Jesus was married is the so-called Jesus family tomb, or the, uh, the lost tomb of Jesus family, uh, a sensationalized story in which uh, a couple of uh, guys got together and, and argued that they had found the tomb in which Jesus and his family members were buried just outside Jerusalem. They claimed that it was Jesus, his wife Mary Magdalene, their son Judah, Jesus' mother Mary, his father Joseph, and a couple of other people. There's one biblical scholar, uh, James Tabor, who supports this claim. Nobody else will. Uh, uh, all the people at the Society of Biblical Literature who are biblical scholars, who are not Christians, who are not evangelical, orthodox, Catholic, or anything, who are looking for excuses to ridicule the Bible, and you can't, you know, you, you can't uh, get three of them to stand in a room together and admit that there's anything to this story. So when you start investigating claims like this, if you find that there's some, you know, uh, uh, renegade individual making a claim or some small group of people that, you know, uh, their biggest claim to fame is things like making the movie uh, Titanic, uh, you might want to not trust it too much. Uh, determine the sources, assumptions, biases, and expertise of any. Now, Bart Ehrman is certainly an expert in New Testament textual criticism. He knows his stuff. And he gets a lot of facts right. I just want to make that observation. He, in fact, I would say he gets a surprising number of things right, considering that he is a self-proclaimed agnostic. But Ehrman makes it clear in his writings that he isn't open to entertaining the possibility of the supernatural or miraculous as a causal factor in the origins of Christianity. In short, 
we start with the assumption that Jesus did not rise from the dead, and we make the evidence fit. Another principle to keep in mind when you're trying to assess various claims is make sure that you're understanding people first. Let people speak for themselves before deciding uh, what they mean or drawing conclusions about whether you agree with it or not even. There's a little comic here where a guy uh, is looking at a, something that was written and he says, I think you're misinterpreting it. The other guy says, I wrote it. You know, you think he would be pretty well informed about the meaning of what he wrote. For some reason, people don't take this seriously. Uh, they, they claim that they know better than you what you meant. And uh, they would never f stand for it if it was reversed, of course. And here we can invoke what I and Doug Grotice and others have called the golden rule of apologetics. Treat other people's writings the way you would like them to treat yours. <laughs> A lot of fake news falls in this category. Just go back and find what the person actually said and let him explain it. Now, don't assume that you're always right and that what you've heard here can't be right and you're not going to change your mind. Be willing to change your view if the evidence warrants it. Where is it written that once you become a Christian, you stop learning? It, it ought to be the other way around. That once you become a Christian, that's when you really get going with learning. Because now you're at least going in the right direction. It's vitally important that if we're going to do apologetics with integrity, if we're going to defend the faith against false religions with integrity, that we be open to learning. That we be open to admitting, I might have been wrong about that. Uh, you've got an interesting point. You've taught me something I didn't understand. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. The shame is in not being willing to admit that you're possibly misinformed on something. Well, what do we do, though, when we've, we've established what the facts are as best we can, but Christianity seems to conflict with the facts? How do we handle this? Well, we need to understand uh, some things about Christianity in relation to facts or history or science or anything like that. First of all, <clears throat> Scripture is God's Word and it is a source of truth, but the world in which we live, nature, history, the world that God made is also a source of truth. We don't want to fall into the mistake of thinking that all truth has to be found directly from the Bible, and everything else is suspect. The Bible itself doesn't make that claim, nor should we. And, you know, that balance there is difficult for many of us because there are times when it seems like Christianity and the world of facts that is outside the Bible uh, conflict. But we need to rec start with the proper foundational understanding of the way things really are, which is the world was made by God. What happens, happens. What is, in, what is real in the world is real, and it is true, and it needs to be dealt with. Now, <clears throat> I believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. I'm a very conservative evangelical in that regard. Scripture is definitely, as far as I'm concerned, the inerrant Word of God. Uh, my interpretation, not so much. So, one possibility when there appears to be a conflict between the facts of Scripture, and really we should say the facts of Scripture and the facts outside Scripture, one possibility is that I'm misinterpreting the Bible. It could be that I've misread or misunderstood something in Scripture. The same thing is true on the other side, though. Facts are facts, but our interpretation of the facts is also subject to error, also might be mistaken, also might need to be corrected. So we don't come at these apparent conflicts between so-called science and the Bible, that, that, that supposed conflict, with the assumption that it has to shake out, quote unquote, in our favor, meaning confirming what we've already decided is true as Christians or biblically. It could be that we've misunderstood something in the Bible. It could be that something that we find in the world of nature or history may revise our understanding of the Bible, not 
correct it, not in the sense of not, not disagreeing with the Bible, but correcting our misunderstanding of the Bible, helping us read the Bible more accurately. And shouldn't that be our goal? We should want to understand God's Word as accurately as possible. Outside information could help us in that process. Theology and science are both human activities. They're both human endeavors. As such, they are both subject to error. We make mistakes. We make mistakes in our interpretation of Scripture. We make mistakes in our interpretation of the world. There's no shame in admitting that, even though we might not like it. Now, how do we leave a legacy of truth and defending the truth in our day? Well, let's talk about apologetics more directly now. There are three ways, I think, that people can think about apologetics. First, apologetics is for experts. The model of apologetics here is that the apologist is the expert that you call in to answer questions, to settle disputes. He knows, we don't, let's ask the expert. Problem is, among the other problems, is that an expert isn't always available or around when you need one. <laughs> Besides, to be honest, sometimes the experts disagree. And then what are you going to do? That's why Scripture commands all Christians to be prepared to defend their faith, classically in 1 Peter 3.15. Second model is that apologetics is like an emergency first aid kit or perhaps like an emergency medical technician. Rush to the scene to administer aid in an emergency situation. I've had this happen to me, by the way. I've gotten calls, so-and-so in my family, my daughter, I remember one occasion, for example, she's going to marry a Mormon. Can you come talk to her? so she doesn't join the Mormon religion. So I'm supposed to be rushed in there uh, with my uh, first aid kit, with my, my theological aid to uh, save her from the brink of falling into the heresy of Mormonism. A couple problems with this. One is that sometimes the EMT arrives too late. That was the case with that young woman. It really wasn't about the issues, the evidence, the arguments, the facts. It was about that she really liked her Mormon boyfriend and his friends, and she just wanted to be part of that. But if her parents had, and her church, if she had one, had taken seriously her upbringing in the Word of God from day one and explained to her the differences and explained Mormons very often are just really nice people, but there are some problems with their religion you need to know about. The whole thing could have been avoided. But in this particular case, it was clear the parents had not really taken that seriously and they had reached out to me or the organization I was part of simply out of desperation because they were uncomfortable with her joining the Mormon religion. Number three, I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this and that this is the one I'm going to favor. Apologetics is a function of a Christian mind. Apologetics means knowing what you believe, being prepared to explain to others why you believe it. The apologist on this model isn't an expert who's called in to settle an issue. It's not an EMT rushed to the scene to save somebody from a drastic theological error. The apologist is a coach or a teacher who helps you learn what you need to learn. Apologetics is really an aspect of loving God with all of our mind, which is part of what Jesus called the greatest commandment, and it's also part of loving our neighbor, which Jesus said was the second commandment like it. We love God, we're going to want to know the truth about God, and we're going to want to represent that truth to others. And if we love our neighbor, we're going to want that neighbor to know the truth too. 
It's as simple as that. That's why love and truth can't be set at, at odds with one another. Genuine love cares about truth. And if you know the truth, you are going to want to love people and love God. Apologetics from another perspective is simply one important aspect of the Bible itself. And this uh, table here illustrates that point with a number of books from the New Testament. We could do this with every book of the New Testament, I think, but especially I've highlighted some that really stand out. So, for example, Luke Acts, which is a volume one, volume two, uh, history of the origins of the Christian movement by Luke, shows that Christianity uh, was not uh, an illegal movement, nor was it a superstitious religion but that it was founded in fact and rooted in ancient uh, truth spoken by prophets uh, that was fulfilled marvelously in the person of Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection. And you can see a number of other uh, places there in the New Testament where various books have a very strong apologetic function. They are concerned about addressing false doctrine or uh, abandonment of the Christian faith, or bad arguments against Christianity. And so, really, uh, the whole New Testament has this apologetic aspect to it. Developing a Christian mind is an integral part, then, of being a disciple. The word disciple literally means a student. Someone who follows a teacher as a way of life. So not just book learning, but life learning, which includes learning how to think about the world from a particular point of view. That's what a disciple is. Apologetics means more than just refuting error or answering questions or doubts, although those are very important things. I'm not going to stop doing those things. But most of all, apologetics is about teaching people how to think how to engage the issues of their society, their culture, and their day in a way that's faithful to the Word of God and that genuinely takes seriously the evidence and the facts that are out there. It means modeling and teaching what it means to have a Christian mind. What does a Christian mind look like? I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. I hope this whets your appetite for exploring some of these. A Christian mind integrates our understanding of the Word of God with our understanding of the world of God. A Christian mind is aware of our own assumptions, our presuppositions, our biases, as well as our way of reasoning. We are self-reflective about why we think the way we do. That's crucial to a well-developed Christian mind. A Christian mind is resolutely committed to the truth and not to an ideology. Now, what do I mean by that? An ideology is what the organization says we're all supposed to believe. That organization can be a denomination, it can be a school. It can be a movement that you have identified yourself with in some fashion. But it is a party that has a well-developed kind of list of things people are supposed to agree upon. Now, if you are part of such a party or a movement or a group because you have become convinced that that is correct, that that's a correct understanding as a whole, that's fine. But if you're a Christian, there's always the possibility that as you learn more, you find yourself having to disagree with something. I don't know how, with all of the many different questions and issues that might come up in talking about the truth of the Bible, which is a very long book and has a lot to say and deals with some pretty tough issues. If you're in lockstep 100% agreement with 10 million other people 
on everything. How much careful thinking are you actually doing? Won't there be times where you say, you know what, a lot of people that I associate with believe this, I'm not so sure. Or I have a little bit different way of thinking about it. Not something I'm going to divide over, but just something that I'm thinking through or something where maybe I, I look at it a little bit differently than some other people. An apologist is not supposed to be a propagandist. Your goal is not to defend the organization no matter what. Your goal is to know the truth and share it with others. That means that you're more concerned about being faithful to Scripture than you are to a post-biblical document or a modern uh, group of people who have set out what they think. Now, again, you may agree 100%, uh, but you might not. And, uh, and, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, we should be as united as we can be, but we're not going to be 100% in agreement on everything. It just isn't going to happen, if we're being honest. Because we don't all know everything, because we all make mistakes, because we have different backgrounds and experiences and perspectives. Uh, all those things are part of the human condition. We know in part... Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. Man, I don't like that. I want to know in full. Been spending my whole life pursuing that. But you know what? I still know in part. <laughs> That's the way it is. A Christian mind is critical and discerning, but not judgmental. This is real tough. This is almost about tone more than anything. You can disagree with somebody without getting all in their face and judging them and saying, you're going to hell, and you know. To be discerning does not mean to be antagonistic. We're just disagreeing. We're just sharing what we understand to be the truth as best we understand it, which is fallibly. So it's, it's crucial that we be humble about what we understand even as we are confident in the word of God. I am totally convinced that God knows what he's talking about. I am pretty confident about some of the things I believe and less confident about others. And I'm, I'm good with that. Developing a Christian mind is extremely important when we're dealing with false religions. Christians who have a faithful and biblically sound worldview are much less likely to fall for false religions. You're, you're, you're inoculated. You're immune. Because you know what the truth is. You know the essentials. False versions of Christianity, on the other hand, feed off the lack of a sound Christian mind within Christianity as a whole. This is what, I guess it was Van Balen who first called it, the unpaid bills of the church. Because we have not, as a corporate body, thought through issues as thoroughly and carefully and honestly and studiously as we could have or should have, we often leave things really unaddressed that the heretical groups swoop in and say they've got the answers on those things. Why do you think Jehovah's Witnesses want to talk with you at the door about the kingdom? Because they know most Christians don't know anything about the kingdom. <laughs> that's, that's why. They've got something that you haven't thought about much and they're going to exploit it. The answer to that is not to slam the door in their faces. The answer to that is to learn what the New Testament says about the kingdom of God. And guess what? Guess who talked about the kingdom of God more than anybody else in the Bible? Jesus Christ. So if you don't know what the kingdom of God is and you can't explain it to the Jehovah's Witness at the door, not only are you not able to help the Jehovah's Witness, you're missing something. Your understanding of Christianity is seriously impoverished if you haven't even been able to grasp something that was basic to the teaching of Jesus. 
Finally, the more we have Christians of sound mind permeating the church, waiting eagerly and reaching out eagerly to people outside, the more inviting the church will be for people who have become disillusioned with their false religion and are not sure what to believe next. You know, we could just stand still and people are going to keep streaming in droves out of some of these groups. Mormonism has gone through a serious crisis of various issues being uh, revealed uh, to the world uh, by the internet that has caused a great deal of consternation and a lot of people have left. But are they becoming evangelicals? Most of them are not. Most of them are becoming skeptics. They're becoming agnostics or atheists. Or at least they're going through a long, traumatic period of not knowing what to believe. The more we are prepared, and by the way, the similar phenomenon in the Jehovah's Witnesses, very similar. The more we are prepared to show them, not by just talking at them about it, but by living it, by being it ourselves, what sound Christian thinking looks like, the more attractive we're going to make Christianity to those who realize what they were taught is baloney, but have been told that the same thing is true about Christianity. Let's not give them any excuse for that. Let's model sound Christian mind by studying scripture, by talking about these issues that divide us and learning as much as we can from one another and developing a sound way of explaining the gospel to people who desperately need it. Um, I don't know what we were, time we were scheduled to stop. I'm sure it was earlier than now, but we got started late. So thank you very much for your attention.